Hello, everyone. Please let me know if you can see me. Perfect, Lindsay. I'm so glad. Thank you. Hello, Leanne. Happy birthday. Hi, Lindsay, and how is Quinnell? And rainy and colder than normal. Okay, but nice today. That's good. I'm glad to hear it's nice today. Well, welcome from Calgary. Nice to have you here with us. So my name is Diane Bryan. I am from uh, Health Promotion here at 17 Wing Winnipeg. And today I will be your host uh, to talk about hydration and nutrition during exercise. So what do you need to drink and eat before, during, and after exercise? For um, yeah, we'll, we'll start with that. So this should go about an hour, um, or a little bit less than an hour. And, uh, there'll be opportunity to answer questions. I will be turning my camera off in a little bit. So people will not have to look at me, but, uh, we'll be able to focus more on the, on the PowerPoint that is there. So let's get started. So if you've missed a session, uh, here are the sessions that are uh, that we've already done in this Getting Race Ready series. So um, you can take a picture of this if you want. These are also available on the uh, CAF Connection site. You can find a list of all the recordings as well. And for those of you who joined us last week, um, our session did not go as planned. So we had a little bit of technical difficulty. I guess Demio was down that day or they were working on some updates and uh, we could not do the recording. So we have rearranged the recording. Recording. We will be doing it on Friday at one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So one o'clock in Ontario. That is the registration link. If I had your name from last time I would have sent you an email if you did not get an email from me please either write down this uh, this link so you can join us on Friday if you're able or uh, it's also on CAF connection on the national webinar page it'll be in bright yellow apparently so we hope to see you there uh, Leona and I are looking forward to being able to give that one to you so before we get started just a few things. So this presentation you are about to view is the intellectual property of the Department of National Defense. So any reproduction or retransmission of the slides contained in this presentation is strictly for forbidden. Uh, some of the topics discussed in this webinar might be of a sensitive nature, not really too much, but when we talk about nutrition, some of the nutrition that we talk to, we talk about for adults may not be appropriate for children. So that we just ask for your parental discretion as we go over this. And please understand that the people's or people's stories are theirs alone to tell. So if anybody wants to share anything in this webinar, we will only be using the chat. Um, and really, please don't discuss that outside the webinar. So this webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the PSP YouTube channel eventually, but also on CAF Connection. So though through active partic though I'd really like you to be actively participating, uh, you can simply follow along without using the chat if you prefer. All right, so let's let's go to the first poll question.
And I am going to turn my face off. So I will see you again at the end. So nice to see. Good cross section of everybody. So some serving members, some veterans, family members, a couple of civilian employees, and an other. Interesting. Very cool. So welcome. So let's get uh, started. So here's the agenda for today. Okay, maybe I didn't put the agenda on there. So what we're going to look at for the agenda is what's the purpose of nutrition before exercise? Why do we want to have nutrition before exercise? What do you need for exercise as far as nutrition goes? And what are your needs as far as recovery goes? So really very short things that we're going to be looking at. Um, we will look at why fuel before exercise is important. And we'll look at what you can consume before, during, and after exercise so that you have the energy to enjoy activity today and that you can recover so that you can be more active again tomorrow. So as we know, the human body, and when we're looking at goals for food and fluid before exercise, the very first goal is to prevent dehydration. And we want to provide that energy that we need in order to exercise and then finally prevent hunger during exercise. So as we know, the human body has a high water content and your body works best when fluid levels are high. Just like your car. Your car works so much better when the fluid levels are high than when oil levels or transmission levels are low. So fuel and car fluid and carbohydrate rich fuel foods are the main focus for exercise. The length of time between your meal and your physical workout will determine how much and which foods you choose. Individual tolerance is also going to play a factor. Right? But we need to be looking at that goal, that threefold goal, to prevent dehydration, to provide energy for the duration of the exercise, and to prevent hunger during the exercise. So the general rule is that the more time you have prior to exercising, the more food you could eat. So what might that look like? Let's talk about fluid first. So how much fluid do you typically drink during the day? If you wouldn't mind putting that in the chat, that would be great. Twelve cups of water. That's awesome, Avis. Not nearly enough. Working on. I'm with you, Catherine. I do not drink enough water. I try. Yeah, about two liters. That's actually really good because that's the suggestion. Is that we should be getting approximately two liters or more per day. So, are we drinking? I can't do more than one point five liters. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. So I guess um, some questions to ask yourself, are you drinking a variety of fluids? Are you getting your fluid content just from water or are you getting it from a variety of places? So maybe from some, some juice, from some water, maybe some tea, um, coffee, I'll give you your first cup of the day would count as fluid, but maybe from soup or um, not that you're probably drinking it today, but also you get fluids from vegetables. <laughs> okay, well, that would be your two liters of fluid, but I don't think that counts, Catherine. Right, so another question to ask yourself is, are you thirsty before you drink something? Chances are... Yeah, chances are if you're thirsty before you drink something, you're already dehydrated. So what are some reminders that you can have to help you to consume fluids? What are some things that you could um, do to ensure that you're drinking enough? Yeah, keep that water bottle at your desk at work. Absolutely. I must admit that now that I'm working at home, I don't typically have a water bottle beside me all the time. So I find that I'm drinking less at home than I would at work. 
So that's one of the things that I've noticed. But yeah, so having that um, that water bottle, having drinking some fluid at each meal or snack. Right. Take a break if you're working out at the gym between each set. Go and get some water. Right. Or if you're playing squash, maybe after five points. There's quite a there's quite a range in the volume of fluid needed. So they're looking at they're telling you that you need to drink about 300 to 600 milliliters of fluid two to four hours before. And then it's as you get closer, it's 150 to 350 milliliters, about 15 minutes before. That's the reason for that big range is because it depends on your body weight, your gender, your fitness level, genetics, how hot or humid it is, and individual tolerance. So the best rule is to monitor your urine output. Be sure to be well hydrated well before your activity. So two to four hours before your activity. Planning ahead is so important. Now, this is difficult for me because I usually like my activity first thing in the morning as soon as I get up. But I do always drink water as soon as I get up. So that helps. Uh, so I guess my best suggestion for you is to experiment with the amount of water that you can use and, and learning, learning what your tolerance is. That's going to be the most important thing um, to know. Like how much can your body tolerate and experimenting with that. Yeah, that's a good one. Taking sips at breaks in your workout. Absolutely, Anne. Leanne. <laughs> so when we're looking at hydration, the amount, the urine amount in color is a good indication of your hydration status. So we want to aim for that pale yellow. So if we look at this, this diagram here, the pale yellow, one, two, and three would be considered well hydrated. Anything below that, look, you start to be dehydrated and you should really look like, you should really be considering drinking uh, some more fluids. All right. What might be a pre-workout fruit that benefits your performance during exercise? Any guesses? Bananas, gold star for you. Absolutely. Yeah, bananas have complex sugars, which means if you eat a banana, it will provide sustained release of carbs into the bloodstream. So when you're at the gym, you want a continuous supply of carbohydrates in your bloodstream. So you, so if you consume simple carbohydrates like sugar, it will be utilized very fast and your body will start breaking down muscle for further energy. This process is called protein catabolism. When we're at the gym, we want to build muscles. The very purpose of working out will not be met if our body breaks down our hard-earned muscles to provide that energy. So bananas are very good. They'll provide us with that energy and, and they'll help us to sustain us a little bit as well. So the fuel that we can look at before exercise, we've got two to four hours before exercise, you can pretty much eat a balanced meal to ensure your adequate carbohydrate stores are going to be um, replenished. Your meal can include a little protein and fat, but stay away from high fat, fat content or a large serving of protein because this is going to slow down the digestive system and you're going to feel uncomfortable during your activity. So lower fats such as lean meat, steamed vegetables, or rice and baked potato, not fries, is one option. Pasta with vegetables and a meat sauce rather than cream sauce is another choice. If you only have a couple hours before the workout, a snack with fluid, a grain product, and some fruit will top up your energy, depending on your tolerance and the situation water and or juice, whether it's vegetable juice or fruit juice, and toast or part of a bagel or low fat crackers um, are options. Alternatively, water, lower fat yogurt, low fat granola, and fruit may be your preference. If you're competing, a nervous stomach may limit your choices. So it's a really good idea to test your pre-exercise food during training so that you know your tolerance to various foods. If I'm getting ready to run the marathon 
in the army run, I should be trying out the food that I'm going to take on my run prior to the run. So that I don't find myself in trouble during that run. Right? We want to choose foods that are easy to digest. Remember, protein and fat digest slowly, so we want to limit that amount. And be careful with foods that are heavily spiced or high in fiber, unless you know that you can tolerate them well. High fiber foods may cause discomfort if eaten just before exercise, unless you eat them regularly. Pick familiar foods that do not upset your stomach. In order to consume enough food energy, you may need more concentrated foods like juice or dried fruit to get that concentration of energy that you're going to need. Are there any questions? So what we're asking you to do is think about smart fueling. The more glycogen you can store and the longer you can save your stored glycogen, the better you can perform on that home stretch of a strenuous long duration activity. So whether it's the half marathon or the marathon, or if you're going on a bike ride for a couple hours, the more glycogen we can store, that then the, long, the more energy we're going to be able to have for that. Right, so we need to really eat that appropriate amount of carbohydrates to keep our stores uh, topped up. I'm going to show you a slide. This is a this slide is is about a a graph that depicts the low and high carbohydrate intake on restoration of my muscle glycogen between training sessions. Now these are uh, endurance bikers, so it's people that would do perhaps something like the Tour de France, who are out there biking really hard three days in a row. So the blue shows you somebody who's who's on a high carbohydrate diet. And you'll notice that they're able to keep their muscle glycogen stores up, topped up throughout the, the entire period, where those that are on the low car carbohydrate diet, only having 40% of their total calories coming from carbohydrate, really are struggling when it comes to day three. They really don't have the muscle glycogen in order to be able to compete with the, with the other people. All right, so the muscle glycogen gradually declined over the three days of the study with people who are on the low carbohydrate diet and the high carbohydrate diet was able to return to the glycogen to near normal every day, which is kind of amazing. So remember, the optimal carbohydrate intake is 45 to 60 percent of your total calories. Generally, the more endurance activities you're planning to do, the more carbohydrates you're going to need. So being at that higher level of the carbohydrate range recommendation is what you're going to need to keep those glycogen stores topped up. So when your diet has little carbohydrates, about 40% of the kilocalories, that glycogen doesn't get replaced. And after several wake up workouts, your muscles get tired and you may feel lack of in of energy. The effort may seem greater. Your legs may feel heavy. They feel like they have no energy. Have you ever had that feeling? When you're trying to go on a run or you're trying to do a bike ride, and you just don't seem to have any gas left in your legs. What do you remember about those situations? I definitely have two, Leona. Yeah, yeah you feel like you're going in reverse. Absolutely. It's just awful. So having a high carbohydrate meal or snack before and after exercise will keep that muscle glycogen level high. Right? And remember, too, that a higher carbohydrate diet is meant to include adequate protein and fat. 
right? Balance is really important. We're not telling you not to have protein, not to have fat. We're just telling you to be to ensure that you're not neglecting the, the carbohydrates. So let's talk about protein now. So we don't forget the protein. In addition to carbs, it's a good idea to consume a little bit of protein before your workout, especially true if you're weight training. Uh, when we do strength training exercises, we create small tears in our muscle fibers. When you rest, your body repairs those micro tears, building up your muscles bigger and stronger than they were before. And it needs protein to do it. But that does not mean you want to pound back a burger before your workout. Instead, go for sources of protein that are easily digestible and don't eat too much so that you don't get an upset stomach halfway through your five mile run. So some examples of good sources of protein to eat before a workout could include nuts, Greek yogurt, a slice of turkey, a hard boiled egg, milk or soya milk. Bacon. <laughs> Ah, uh, but just remember the fat, Tyler. Just remember the fat. <laughs> so this is this is one way of, of looking at how you can fuel. There's actually two ways of looking at how you can fuel yourself for exercise. It's important to look at when you fuel your body throughout a typical day and how you divide your food for the day so that you have a so that you can have a meal or snack before exercise. So I'm not necessarily saying that you need to eat extra food, but just look at how you got your day planned and your food planned around when you're going on your run or your bike ride or going to exercise, right? So the very first example shows a person getting up, having a snack, then they have PT. So they're getting their little bit of carbohydrate, maybe a little bit of protein before their PT, and then they're coming in, they're using breakfast as their recovery meal going to work, having lunch, and they work. They might have a pre-exercise food or snack during work, traveling to training, do some training, traveling home, recovery food, and dinner. Right, the second one, we're looking at somebody who's having breakfast first in the morning, goes to work, and maybe is, is their training or their workout is just before lunch. So they're going to have a little bit of a snack before before they go training. Their lunch becomes their recovery meal. Go back to work, have snack. Then they're going to their sports game or whatever. And then again, their dinner becomes their their recovery meal. So looking at how you spread your food out through the day and when you train is really important. Right? So some questions to ask yourself. When do you schedule your exercise? And then when do you eat relative to your exercise? Have you topped up the tank with carbohydrates before heading to training? Because when we look at during the day, our carbohydrate stores are filled at meal times and then gradually used until the next opportunity to eat. So if you eat regularly, you will have energy for both mental and physical work. If you've not eaten for five or six hours before a workout or your favorite sport or during mental tasks, you may likely feel tired or sluggish. You may be irritable or you may be a little lightheaded or headed or headachy. So to get the best results from your workout, your body needs to have fluid and carbohydrate for fuel. So things to look at. Perhaps Leanne, yeah, the, because he's relying on his on his main meals. Hard to say. Hard to say. But there are options when we're looking at at uh, how you get your energy balance throughout the day, and I think that's what this this slide is meant to tell us is, is to make sure that we're looking at those options. Okay, so food and flu fluid during exercise. <laughs> so the major concern during exercise is to stay hydrated and to provide energy during longer training sessions. If you're planning to exercise less than one hour, then water is probably sufficient. 
However, if you're planning to exercise at a higher and in, high intensity for more than an hour, you will need to add fluids, carbohydrate, and possibly sodium. The tolerance is individual and also dependent on the type of exercise. So for example, going for a walk or, or, or hiking versus running. So true or false, drinking water during your workout decreases your performance. False. Absolutely. Great. It increases your performance. Absolutely, Tyler. For sure. So during exercise, fluid is critical for maintaining blood volume, regulating blood body temperature, and for muscle contraction. Sweating is a body's way of maintaining core temperature while exercising, but the loss of body fluid that occurs can result in dehydration. So the fluid, if the fluid intake is suboptimal, then we be, could become dehydrated. Generally, the body has a good capacity to tolerate low to moderate levels of dehydration. However, as levels of dehydration rise, performance can be impaired. Just water. Yeah, I'm very much just a water person too. Yeah. So let's look some more on, on fluids. So dehydration reduces exercise performance and makes exercises seem harder. If you are dehydrated, your body is unable to cool during exercise and you may develop heat illness. And we'll be talking about um, working in heat uh, next week. As well, the following may be impacted. So you may find you have an increased heart rate, increased perception of effort, increased fatigue, impaired cognitive performance so with skill or coordination, gastrointestinal issues such as nausea can all be impacted by dehydration. So muscle is approximately 75% water and fat is approximately 28% water. So if you're, if you're, dehydrated then what are your muscles looking like like how how are your muscles feeling if 75 percent of muscle is typically water or fluid i just think it's probably they're just screaming at me feed me by the time you're thirsty you've lost about two percent of your body weight in the form of fluid when fluid levels drop this amount, there's a 15 to 20% performance de decline, which is pretty amazing as well. Right? It only takes a dehydration of 2% body weight to impact my performance by 15 to 20%. The other thing too is exercise dulls the sensation of thirst. So you may find that you perform better if you follow a schedule for consuming fluid. So you need to have that plan for fluid intake while you're spiking or while you're running. So what might some things that you could do for at least for biking and running that you can do to ensure that you can stay hydrated? Because I know I struggle with this when I go out for a walk in the morning and I'm gone for an hour and a half and I'm thinking like, I'm just walking. I don't have anywhere to put a water bottle. I have to carry it with me. This is really gross. Or I put it in a backpack and then I have to take the backpack off and pull out the water bottle, which means that I don't drink the water when I'm out there, which is probably not a good thing. So what are some ideas that you have? Just buy a bottle of this honey and down it at the nearest store. <laughs> I do need a hydration belt, Leo. A water bottle, black pack with a hose. Yeah. The Sani is different. Okay. But yeah, that Tyler, that might be an option is just stopping at the 7-Eleven and going in and getting some, some water and, and downing it there and carrying on. But you need but make sure you have that plan for when you're when you're exercising. What is my plan for, for being out there? How am I going to get that water? So here's some signs of, of dehydration. 
So decreased frequency of urination, rapid resting heart rate, prolonged so muscle soreness, because again, remember, 70% of your muscles are fluid, tired, no energy, muscle cramps, dark yellow, strong smelling urine. And the other thing to remember too is severe dehydration can lead to heat exhaustion, heat stroke, and even death. So really important to maintain your fluids while you're exercising. So food and fluid during high intensity exercise, so lasting more than an hour. Now, we need to still drink enough to maintain our fluid balance. So, and water still is the great fluid replacement and all that is needed, right? You may not need any, <laughs> any other type of fluid except for that water. So again, for high intensity exercises lasting longer than an hour, fluid is the main concern. The amount of fluid you require will depend on many factors such as the environment, what's the temperature like, what's the humidity, your body weight and fitness level, your sweat rate, your genetics. During exercise, it's re recommended to drink 150 to 350 milliliters, which is a half to one and a half cups of water um, every 15 to 20 minutes. So that equals to about 500 milliliters or 1.5 liters per hour. So Leanne, that's like your daily fluid intake. Because the sweat rate variations from person to person vary, varies between person to person, the recommended range of fluids is quite, raw, quite wide. So what are some challenges related to fluid replacement at regular intervals? We did talk about some of them. So if you're out doing a 30K bike ride or you're out practicing for the half marathon, what are some challenges related to that for your fluid replacement? Okay, get in the zone and you forget to drink. Sure. I'm also afraid sometimes to drink because I figure halfway through then I'm going to have to go to the bathroom. Yeah, the ability to carry enough on your person, for sure, Leanne. Absolutely. Or you get that what? Yes, Tyler. You get that water splashy belly, which feels awful. For sure. Okay, so the other consideration besides ensuring that you're getting the fluid is, is carbohydrates. If exercise is longer than an hour, a source of carbohydrate is helpful to keep energy levels high. This could be diluted juice, a sports drink, and or food. However, beware that too much carbohydrate can slow fluid absorption. So they say that between 4 to 8% carbohydrate to water is shown to be the concentration where water and carbohydrate enter the bloodstream quickly. If there's too much carbohydrate in a drink, water is drawn from your body into the digestive tract to dilute the carbohydrate and allow absorption. And that can cause dehydration. Right, so you want to consume about 30 to 60 grams per hour, but you really want to ensure that you're consuming only 4 to 8% with your water for your best absorption rate. It's a good one, Tyler. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so we have some choices. If you're doing a workout to stay healthy or are you training at a high level for a test or qualification or for a high level competition? Those are some questions you need to ask yourself when you look at making choices for the types of things that you can have. For recreational pursuits, diluted juice with a pinch of salt supplies, the needed nutrients, fluid, carbohydrate, and sodium, as well as vitamins and minerals. At a very high level of training intensity, a sports drink may provide some benefits in that it is designed 
for the very fast absorption of both fluid and carbohydrate. And it's also got the right amount of carbohydrates to, to the fluid for you. So you need to look at your whole diet and your goals. The other thing to remember too is that sugar in your fluid choice is different. So glucose in sports drinks is, absorb, is absorbed more quickly than fructose. Fructose is a sugar in fruit. Table sugar is made up of both glucose and fructose. Fructose reaches your bloodstream slowly and your liver must convert it to glucose before it can be used for energy. Fructose is often used to sweeten soft drinks and fruit drinks, and too much fructose can cause abdominal discomfort and cramps. And if that's the case, a commercial sports drink is a better choice. So some initial trial and error during training and low competitions is crucial to determine the best suitable food and fluid choices for you. Right, so the fuel choices. Solid food, foods need to be high in carbohydrate, easily digested, and absorbed quickly. The time available and the intensity of the workout are other considerations. The shorter the break and the higher the work intensity, the easier the food must digest. So we're looking at that. So whether you're selecting foods like grain products or sandwiches, fruit, juice, yogurt, Probably not doing that if I'm out running or biking. You never know, though. Uh, <laughs> Low-fat cookies or bars. Your main concern is high carbohydrate with mu not much fat because fat slows digestion. So look for products that have less than 3 grams of fat per 30 grams of serving of grain products. So low-fat, high-carb bars, bars are convenient, easy to carry, and relatively indestructible. But you also want ones that taste good. So some cereal bars that are on the market would do the trick and taste much better and are much cheaper than sort of the designer sports bars that we see or gels. And so sport gels are also an option. Um, these are consumed by some athletes for quick energy. It is important to drink plain water with a sports gel to avoid stomach upset. Most gels contain 20 to 30 grams of carbohydrates, but lack sufficient electrolytes. Some gels may also contain caffeine and vitamins, but really, really important to ensure that you're having that water with it to help dilute it. And there are many sports bars available and generally can be classified into three categories. So you have your high carbohydrate with low protein, lower carbohydrate with moderate protein and high carbohydrate with high protein. So what you're looking for while you're doing your activity is you want a high carbohydrate with low protein sports bar. That's what would be most suitable for endurance events or during multi-event competitions. All right? So you wanna test the new foods and fluids while you're training, not the time to try them the day of the race and find out that they don't agree with you, right? And again, looking at food safety. So right now it's the summertime. So you want things that aren't going to melt, aren't going to spoil when you're out in the heat and that are going to keep their shape or not be a complete mess when you try to eat it, right? In the winter time, if you're out running or riding in the winter time, you want things that aren't going to freeze as well because it would be very difficult to have to eat something and found it, find out that it was frozen. So those are some considerations that you have to make when you're choosing the type of fuel that you need when you're exercising for longer than an hour. Any questions so far? All right. So for exercising longer than three hours, or I would say if you're exercising in extreme heat, then sodium becomes a consideration. Most Canadians consume twice the salt as recommended. But if you exercise less, so if you're exercising less than three hours, there's generally no need to do anything special aside from ensuring that you're consuming 
a well-balanced diet pro prior to physical activity, not restricting sodium. And you include a regular recovery meal that contains sodium sources, whether that's a sandwich, a cooked meal, soup, milk, yogurt, cereal, whatever. If you're exercised longer than three hours and sodium needs to be part of your during exercise fuel. And we're looking at wanting to have 0.5 to 0.7 grams or 500 to 700 milligrams. So that's a quarter of a teaspoon to 1.5 um, or 1.5 mil milliliters of sodium per liter of fluid. Sodium also improves the taste and overall fluid intake, thus improving the chances of proper hydration. So if you are, if it's in extreme heat or longer than three hours, then ensure that you're getting that sodium back. So let's do a quick summary of, of what we've just talked for food during exercise lasting more than an hour. So carbohydrates and bars need to be diluted the same as carbohydrates in a fluid replacement. Check the grams of carbohydrate on the bar. So 40 grams of carbohydrate needs to be accompanied by one and a half to one liter of water for dilution and easy, easy digestion. So it might be easier to eat a quarter of the bar and one cup of water. So drinks like Gatorade, Power, Powerade, or any of those sports-specific drinks are simple carbohydrates plus electrolytes. The pros for that is it aids in hydration, easily accessible, and gives you that quick energy. The cons is that it may cause cramping, not enough energy for long duration exercises. So if marathon running, it may not have enough of the nutrients that you need to fulfill your run. Gels and chews, um, mix of simple and complex carbohydrates plus electrolytes. Some of them also contain caffeine. So the pros with using chews or gels, quick energy, easy to consume, easy to carry, more substantial energy than the drink alone. Cons can be messy. Um, some contain too much simple carbohydrate and can lead to crashing, and you need to consume a lot of liquid to aid in the digestion of those. And then your bars, your power bar, your clip bar, et cetera, the simple and complex carbohydrate plus protein plus fat plus electrolytes, vitamins and minerals. So pros for that is complete energy source, longer lasting energy than gels or drinks can be used as meal replacements. Cons can be more difficult to consume while moving quickly and may take longer to digest and could be expensive. So um, most cereal bars can do the same trick as as your power bar or clip bar can. So food and fluid after exercise is important if you exercise for more than an hour and you plan to do more exercise within the next eight hours. You need to have a recovery plan. Knowing what to eat and how much will help your muscles rebuild glycogen stores and recover for your next workout. If you've been sweating heavily during activity, fluid replacement is your first concern. Water or sports drink will be absorbed quickly. So your goal is to replace fluid, replace your carbohydrate stores, repair and rebuild your muscles, and raise your immune system. So fluid replacement is normally the first consideration after exercise, especially if you sweat heavily. Timing is really important. When physical work stops, glucose and amino acids are moving across cell membranes quickly as, they, as quickly as they did during exercise. This rate of movement into the cells slows down eventually. So you want to eat carbohydrate foods right after exercise because that's the quickest way to refill muscle glycogen stores. If you are to work out again within eight hours, consuming carbohydrate that is absorbed quickly will speed up filling up your muscle glycogen stores and will ensure your muscle, muscles are fueled up. If you get back to your workout in time for lunch or dinner, then that becomes your recovery meal. Otherwise, consuming some carbohydrate within 30 minutes of the activity, followed with some protein. Because two hours after exercise, the rate of nutrient movement has slowed to what would be considered your resting rates.
So very soon after exercise, carbohydrate and amino acids from protein foods enters the muscles quickly. The amino acids provide a building materials to remain to repair muscle tissue. Your body absorbs nutrients more quickly for about two hours after exercise, like I said before. So you want to consume fluid, carbohydrate, and then protein for maximum absorption rates. So you need to replace fluid loss by 150%. So approximately 1.5 liters per kilogram of weight lost. So if you lost two kilograms of weight after exercise, you would need three liters of fluid. So how much do you need to drink? You need to figure out how much you sweat. So you can do this easily by weighing yourself before you go to exercise and weighing yourself when you're done. And that difference is the amount that you've lost through sweat. So sweat ranges from 0.4 to 1.8 liters per hour, depending on the individual. So you need to make that plan of how you're going to get that fluid back. So some hydration tips. Research has have observed that people drink more fluid if the fluid is a flavor they like. If there's a carbohydrate in the beverage and if there's a little sodium salt added to the flavor. Also, if the fluid is within easy reach, more fluid is consumed. So that's why at the end of all these races, you always see them handing you out water or there's uh, you go through the, the food station, the, re the recovery station, and there's always water or milk there for you. So you're able to replace your hydration or you're, be, you're able to rehydrate. According to research from the gym, people prefer chilled beverages and drink more if fluid is chilled. Temperature is an individual preference and has little effect on the absorption rate. So what do you prefer regarding, it's all about what you prefer regarding flavor, temperature, and access. I don't necessarily like water really cold. Uh, not, no, I like it cool, not cold. But yeah, figuring out what it is that you like is going to help you to drink it. All right, so recovery choices. You want to remember that if your exercise is more than an hour, we need to have 30 to 60 grams per hour during exercise. So you want to aim for that 30 to 60 carb grams of carbohydrate per hour during exercise and 60 to 90 grams of carbohydrate after exercise. Carbohydrate plus protein-based snacks are suggestions for recovery and for ultra-endurance events lasting longer. And choices can be mixed and matched to suit your choice, to suit your tastes. So one of the simplest recovery snacks that you could have is probably chocolate milk. Right? If you read the label of chocolate milk, it's actually in the right ratio of carbohydrates to protein. Um and it will give you the proper 60 to 90 gar grams of carb after exercise. So eating after a workout is all about replacing the calories you used up. So it's important to replenish your glycogen that has been depleted in your exercise and eating protein after the workout is a must for speedy muscle recovery. <laughs> Plus food contains electrolytes, which are minerals that your neurons need to fire properly and you lose those when you sweat. So some examples of recovery snacks. So carbohydrate with protein, bagel, chocolate milk, peanut butter sandwich and water, granola bar, apple milk, two fig bars, juice, yogurt, fruit smoothie, low fat muffin, goes on and on. Small almond butter and banana wrap, cottage cheese and fruits, trail mix, tuna and cheddar on whole grain bread, chocolate milk, all of those would be good recovery snacks. So what you need to do is create a fluid 
and recovery plan. So I have a handout for you. So this handout will help you to create your own recovery plan. So it has the goals that you need that we've talked about before exercise, the three Ps, preventing dehydration, providing energy, preventing hunger during exercise. During exercise, the need to stay hydrated, provide energy if it's more than an hour, replace sodium if extreme heat or more than three hours. And then after exercise, looking at those four R's, replace the fluid, refuel carbohydrate stores, repair and rebuild muscles, raise your immune system. So it gives you a, a time to look at. So your pre-run or ride, what is your fluid and, and your nutrition going to look like during it? What are you going to do for your recovery? What are some choices that you have? So opportunity for you to think about it beforehand instead of getting out there and going, now what do I do? So looking at what could be your fluid and your recovery plan for your exercise. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about alcohol and performance. Because <laughs> I've often felt that there's nothing better than a cold beer after a long run. Not necessarily so. So first off, alcohol is a diuretic. And a diuretic is any drug that elevates the rate of urination. So all diuretics increase the excretion of water from bodies, which could lead to dehydration. Alcohol has an effect on the human body that contradicts many of the nutrition and food principles when we talk about fueling ourselves properly for performance. Alcohol stimulates fluid loss via hormones from the brain that influences the kidneys. This increased fluid loss contributes to dehydration. So when we're looking at food and recovery interactions, food must pass through the stomach and into the small intestine to be di digested and absorbed. Alcohol can be absorbed directly through the stomach. So it reaches the bloodstream and other parts of the body very quickly, especially if there is no food in the stomach. Alcohol that reaches the bloodstream via the digestive tract is carried to the liver to be detoxified. The following occurs in the liver. So protein synthesis slows, especially decreases immune system proteins possible decrease in the reproductive proteins like testosterone as well while the alcohol is being detoxified carbohydrate metabolism slows and low blood glucose levels can result glycogen storage requires an adequate blood glucose level alcohol interferes with the absorption of some b vitamins especially thiamine needed to release energy from carbohydrates and fat and alcohol increases the elimination of folate needed to produce new cells. The energy from alcohol results in increased production of fatty acids. So after physical activity training, follow a proper recovery strategy. So replace the fluid with water, juice and or sports drink. Replace the carbohydrate and eat a little um, protein. It's interesting to note that research shows that drinking to intoxication can negate as much as 14 days of the training effect. Training hormones are diminished for up to 96 hours following alcohol consumption. Drinking alcohol after training negates the training effect and the associated residual effect of a hangover can reduce athletic performance by 11.4%, which is pretty amazing. So as much as the beer would be really good, it's not a good idea. What about a near beer option? Well, that's a possibility. That is a possibility. All right. So again, if you missed a session, those are the sessions that we've had already. Um, no, there's one missing on there. Racing strategies. But that was at the beginning, if you got it. And again, on Friday, Leona and I will be uh, here together at, at uh, noon our time in Winnipeg. 
but one o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time to deliver the equipment. Um, if you did not get the login information for that one or the please go to CAP Connection and pick it up. I did email most of the people that were on the call last week with the uh, with the joining the joining instructions. My brain just stopped working. Apparently I have not had enough carbohydrates. Anyways, um, just a couple more things to go through. So if you need to contact me, this is my email address, Brian Diane at cfmws.com. Um, I'm more than happy to try and answer any questions. I do not know everything about nutrition. In fact, I have one more uh, handout for you if you're looking for some more information. So how do I know which information to trust? Gives you some idea of where you can go to get the best information. So, and you can always contact your health promotion office or contact your fitness uh, department at the gym. Okay, so the following resources are available for you. Canadian Forces Members Assistance Program, 1-800-268-7708. Provides confidential 24-7, 365 days of the year referral service. If you're a civilian member, this is also this exact same number that you would use for your EAP. Canada's suicide hotline, if you're struggling, dealing with COVID-19 or any of the other issues that may be happening in your life, please reach out and get the help that you need. For the most up-to-date information on COVID-19, go to uh, the best source, the Government of Canada, coronavirus to get that information family information line 1-800-365 days of the year bilingual service that uh, you your family members and extended family members can use they have actual counselors on the end of the line to be able to help you sexual misconduct response center is there to help you if, should you have experienced any sexual misconduct within the workplace kids help phone is there for you uh, for you and your children so you can call or text to get the support that you need. The ARC line in support of COVID-19 is all things uh, DND around uh, COVID-19. So please look at using that. And then we have one more poll for you. So do you feel that you can apply what you learned today to your daily living? guess I should share it. That would really help. Nice. I'm glad that there was some information that was helpful for you. And then here's a list of the upcoming regularly scheduled uh, seminar webinars that we have. So next week we'll be looking at dealing with heat. Um, so Steph, from uh, fitness and sport will be helping me with that one. So we're pretty excited about doing that. And then we'll look at tra tracking your progress, revising your goal, look at stretching, motivation, mental toughness. So, and don't forget Friday's webinar. All right, any questions or comments before you guys all disappear? You're welcome, Liz. I will see you on Friday. No problem. Thanks, Mavis. Thank you, Leona. You're welcome, Catherine. You're more than welcome. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody.